All well, right. thanks for thanks for the intro. I um, also gave the last talk before lunch yesterday, too. So it uh, seems like I drew the short end of the straw this conference. But thanks, everyone, for, for coming. My name is Julian. I'm the CTO at Astronomer, and I'm joined by um, Jason, who, who leads product for our observability suites. And we're here today to talk about you know, building reliable data products. We've noticed this trend in the industry over the last couple of years that shifted from thinking about pipelines and DAGs and tasks to thinking about data as a product. And you know, we're very privileged at Astronomer because we have a front row seat to everything going on. We've got some pretty cool and interesting stuff to show today. Cool. So I think it's helpful to, before we talk about where we're going, to also talk about kind of the current state and traditional state of observability. And if we think about kind of the traditional state of observability, it's really been about logs, metrics, and traces. As well as recently, really, I think you had vendors in the space really approach it in somewhat of a different manner, really putting SLA or DQ monitors at the data warehouse. Just curious, how many of you in here are using one of these methods in order to build observability within Airflow? Okay, cool. A few of you. No one raised their hand and probably just close my laptop and walk out right here. But so I think one of the aspects, and really I, I come from uh, a customer before Astronomer that we were trying to build observability around Airflow as well. And so what we would do is we go ahead and instrument specific metrics. We go ahead and put SLA monitors to those metrics. And then when it breached a critical threshold, then we go ahead and debug it through specific logs. Now, this worked for really simple pipelines and pipelines without a lot of dependencies, but as you actually built more complex pipelines, then this kind of process became a lot more tenuous, a lot more onerous, and ultimately it was more manual than actually reactive. And so I really think about a lot of kind of the pipelines. I think about it from a traditional, even like a traditional car. So I'm kind of a, a drive it till it dies type of person from a car perspective. So I have a 2012 Prius, and so you can imagine that over the last 12 years, there have been a lot of advances from the, the car standpoint, right? And I think about kind of the observability dashboards that I used to use and how I used to actually monitor pipelines to really the, the dashboard that I would have in my Prius, where you'd have essentially metrics that are based on CPU or memory or specific airflow metrics that are tied to things such as like speed and fuel What in, in the, the car example. You have SLA monitors at the data warehouse level that would monitor a particular critical threshold, similar to how you would do it from an engine or RPM perspective. And then you ultimately would have logs that you would go ahead and debug. And so building out those diagnostic codes in order to understand when you would go ahead and check your engine or check your oil would be a big issue. And so ultimately, I would say that a lot of this has really focused on a couple of things where we've seen a lot of the pain points is one, it's been really isolated in terms of how you go ahead and monitor specific items within the pipeline, the DAGs, the tasks, metrics, everything's been viewed from an individual DAG perspective. And so how you go ahead and unify that. And then ultimately, everything has really been uh, reactive versus proactive and really after the fact versus before the fact. And so I think after the fact in a lot of scenarios, it could actually work pretty well. But in a scenario where, for instance, a check engine light comes on, if this has happened to you, but that is a scenario where the check engine light comes on, 10 seconds after the check engine light comes on, the car dies on the freeway, in the middle of the freeway, on a busy freeway, with a car screaming by 60 to 70 miles per hour. And so in a lot of situations after the fact is okay, but there are situations where you really like to have that predictive maintenance to understand those bottlenecks, those issues within your pipeline, and how to go ahead and remediate. And then similarly, if you take a look at kind of some of the traditional or maybe newer tools in the market that are really focused on uh, SLA monitoring at the data warehouse level, I really view this analogously like checking the coolant level of uh, your car after a trip has ended. And that may be okay in a lot of situations, but if you're uh, traveling in Death Valley, 120 degree temperature, you'd probably like to know the rate of change versus actually when it exceeds that particular critical threshold. So a lot of those things about anomalies, detections, that proactive learning is really critical. And so really what we see is really kind of the traditional pain points about observability today. And what we actually see from our customer base is that it's really been focusing on a reactive motion around observability. Things such as your pipeline assets are really siloed, right? You're monitoring SLAs at the DAG level versus at a kind of a more unified data product level. And then ultimately these lead to specific issues with a breach in SLA and ultimately those lead to negative implications and consequences from a business perspective. And so 
we really view and really where we're making product investments and where we're moving directionally from an observability standpoint is really from this reactive to this proactive world where you're moving from kind of this static uh, view of the world to really more of an autonomous dynamic view. And if you think about, I don't know, you want to take a Waymo ride this week at Airflow Summit. I, I'll be honest, it still kind of unnerves me because I'm crossing a crosswalk here in San Francisco and seeing five Waymo cars coming. I mean, there's no passenger or there's no drivers in the Waymo car. So, but we trust that it's going to stop. We trust it's going to stop, hopefully, because of all the different aspects, all the different telemetry is picking up and proactively remediating all these different inputs as it's, as it's driving. And so in a very analogous vein, I think of it as kind of those dashboards of the past where you're looking at specific static metrics and really moving to that proactive view where you're looking at things such as speed and fuel, but you're looking at it holistically. You look at those metrics and those pipelines holistically. You're looking at all those interdependencies. You're obviously looking at traffic, weather, road conditions to, to determine the most optimal path, the most optimal route in order to get to your ultimate outcome, which is your destination. And then you're looking at that predictive maintenance to understand how you identify those bottlenecks, how you remediate those bottlenecks before you're stuck on a, a freeway. Right. And so we're really looking at things from how we go ahead and move from this reactive world. And Really, you'll see, we're really excited to announce this week, actually, we announced on Tuesday launch of Astro Observe, which we're really excited about. And we're really making a lot of investments to move into this proactive world in terms of how do you first up-level the pipelines, moving from uh, specific DAGs or individual DAGs to tracking it on a more holistic level, more unified level, to ultimately drive it to a data product and ultimately to a business outcome. How do you go ahead and not only identify, and instead of debugging logs, how do you go ahead and identify root cause of a particular issue, where it failed in the particular pipeline? But then ultimately, you want to actually get those proactive alerts to identify how you can actually mitigate those SLA breaches in the future, but also remediate it before that SLA breach happens. And then ultimately, you're also looking at predictive maintenance. All right? You're looking at how do you go ahead and identify those best practices within your pipeline. Like we've managed Airflow for hundreds of customers, and Learned really, I think, a lot of the best practices and probably a lot of it the hard way, but recommending a lot of those best practices, how to go ahead and orchestrate, how you go ahead and build your data in a much more scalable manner so that you can deliver a lot of that business insight. And then ultimately, really about tracking to those interdependencies, similar to how Waymo is looking at all the road conditions, traffic, weather conditions. How do you go ahead and take a look at a lot of those cross-deployment dependencies, those cross-DAG dependencies, those cross-team dependencies? How do you identify that? Not only do you get visibility, but also how do you identify who are the constituents along the pipeline that will help you go ahead and remediate an issue? And so you'll see us really, from an investment standpoint, focus on kind of three main pillars. One is really around that data product notion and how do you kind of unify those specific individual assets within your pipeline in a much more holistic view. And how do you not only go ahead and root cause an issue in a much more streamlined manner, but how do you go ahead and get those proactive alerts to help you remediate issues before they transpire, before you actually breach an SLA? And ultimately, that predictive maintenance, essentially that recommended insights on how you go ahead and build and orchestrate your pipelines in a scalable and efficient manner. And so with that, I will give it to Julian, who will talk a, a little bit more about uh, Astro in the demo. Yeah, before we jump into the product, I wanted to spend a couple minutes real quick talking about our data team, because we've seen this transition happen over the last couple of years. We're, we're fortunate to be joined by a couple members of the, the data team here. Um, if you didn't see their talk yesterday, I definitely would recommend you go watch the recording, because uh, they filled the room. But if you look at you know, how our data team used to historically operate, they were building dashboards for internal folks like myself and Jason. And that's important, right? Like we care about these metrics, but reliability was more of a nice to have, right? If the data was down for a day, maybe they get an angry Slack message from me, but it's not like we're going to go out of business or breach SLAs. Um, and things were thought about kind of more at the pipeline level instead of the you know, business impact and data product level. And you know, the data team was certainly very valuable. I think you know, we established ourselves as a data-driven business, but it's tough to go and quantify the value of dashboards, right? It helps us make more efficient decisions, but it's not super clearly tied to our business. And so there are a couple of things that, that happened over the last, I want to say, year and a half or two. The data team built great dashboards that gave us a view of how customers were using the products. 
to the point where our customer success teams would come to us and say, hey, can I just screen share this dashboard with the customer? Like they would love to have this information too. And that changes the audience from primary, like primarily internal to now external and customers. We transitioned from thinking about things at the pipeline and task level now to data products, right? We start embedding these dashboards in our Astro product, and that's part of the product. That's a feature. That's not just a pipeline. And reliability went from being a nice to have to a need to have, right? We need the same operational rigor with our data team as we do the rest of our Astro engineering teams. And how did the, you know, it's, it's a nice transition to make. How do you actually go about doing it? If you look at what the data team did, they did a, you know, a refactor, a re-architecture, a re-platforming. And the, you know, that transition was, was super successful. Again, they filled the room yesterday with their talk. And this is nice, but like, what if you can't do a re-platform? What if you have hundreds or thousands of teams working with Airflow or you just don't have the time to do so? So we actually you know, took a lot of the lessons that we learned from working with the data team as they made this transition and also our broader customer and community base and turned it into a, a product area that we're now calling Observe. And the interesting thing is you know, observability is not new to us. We've made a ton of investments in observability over the last couple of years as we've, building out our, as we've been building out our platform. And that's materialized for us in, in a couple of different things. So the first is our alerting suite. So we do have alerts that you can define at the DAG or task level on you know, various situations, like if the task is successful or if the DAG has failed or if you're going to breach a time SLA. We have this smart deployment health feature where we've actually taken a lot of our airflow knowledge and built it into the product. And we'll tell you if things look wrong with airflow outside of the binary, is it up or is it not up? Like I mentioned, we now embed the data team's dashboards into the product with this new org level dashboards feature. And that's, you know, we give a ton of analytics and insight into how you're using the product at a higher level. And we give, you know, our customers the ability to go export metrics to wherever they need to. It's oftentimes the case that our customers will use Datadog or Chronosphere or other observability tools. And so getting all that information into one place is, is super important. And it's good, but it's not enough, right? We got a ton of feedback from our customers, from our own data team, from the community. These alerts are great, but they're often several layers removed from the business outcome, right? You can either go configure alerts on every single DAG and task that you have because it might be related to a business outcome, but then you get a ton of noise in your alerts and you start dismissing them after a while. Cross-team and cross-deployment dependencies have always been tricky to solve, too. You know, Airflow is designed to be very single-tenant and, and isolated. And so taking a step back and understanding how your different teams and different deployments and different DAGs are interacting with each other can oftentimes be very obscure. And to Jason's point earlier, you know, all of our alerting today is reactive. It's not proactive, which, again, is a, a good foundation. You need to know when things go wrong so you can go fix them as quickly as possible. But in some senses, all we're doing then is reporting the news. We're telling you that something's gone wrong. And you know, ideally, we move more to a proactive world. And you know, flexibility, it can oftentimes be a double-edged sword. Airflow is very flexible. You can go build whatever you want on it. And that's great if you go build the right things. But you know, when you open up Airflow to a whole suite of developers that might not know how to work with Airflow as well as the people in this room, it's tough to understand if they're using Airflow correctly. And so today, or I guess on Tuesday, we rolled out a new experience specifically designed to help you operate these data products in production. I'll jump into a demo in a second, but it's really centered around a, a couple key capabilities today, and we've got a very long roadmap ahead of us. The first is the ability to actually define your data product. So that lets you bundle these different DAGs and tasks and data sets all towards one business objective that you can track as one unit, as opposed to tracking everything at the individual asset level. The second is lineage, incorporating both like the data lineage side of things, so which tables are created from which other tables, and also process dependencies. So if you use things like external task sensors or trigger DAG run operators, it's oftentimes helpful to get the full picture from both perspectives. And then last but certainly not least is the ability to define, track, and get alerted on SLAs. 
and I'll show more about that in this demo. It all starts with an SLA alert. So here I have my Slack open. We have a couple of data products configured that we're getting alerts on. And I can see here, you know, one of my SLAs was breached. So if I open this in our Astro UI, I can see I have this embedded org dashboards data product in our demo environment. And my most recent SLA check was a miss. That means I, I did not do a good job. I can click into it and drill into what exactly is going on. So in this case, my data product consists of one single asset. This is a, a task, and I can see the SLA was a miss because this task never ran. That's a little bit confusing. It'd be nice to, to know why. And so what we also give you is a graph that shows you visually where things may have gone wrong. I can see here I have two pipelines interacting with a couple different data sources, pulling upstream from Snowflake and then actually using Airflow data sets to manage dependencies. And I can see here, you know, it's this table that failed. I can click into it, learn more, figure out which deployment it's in, what type of task, who owns it, which is all super helpful information for troubleshooting. For the purposes of this demo, I, you know, I, I pushed a, some bad code right before this. And so I can go in and delete that and commit and fix the issue. So if I now remove the data quality failure, let's sort of add it, and go back to my deployment. One of the other things you'll see here is that we're using Astra's new GitHub integration. So all I have to do is push a change to my repository, and I can see almost instantly it's been updated. I can now go to my pipeline, so this is that same table three pipeline that's been failing for a bit, and run it. And what I'll see if I go back to, let me just make sure this loads. What I'll see if I go back to my data product is it's now in a running state. I can see exactly which task is running, and I give, if I give this, uh, looks like it still failed. I did not push, there it is. Okay, now if I push, I should be able to see, ah, yeah, this was earlier today, 10.42. If I refresh, I should see 12.49, there we go. And run it again, there we go. So I can see my data product has now changed from the error state to it's running, it'll tell me exactly which task is running. I can also look at this live execution graph and see how far along it is in the execution process. But I can see here my, my final task is running, so fingers crossed everything will, will be okay. But as you can see, outside of the user error there, the experience has gone from, you know, something fails, my org dashboards aren't up to date, and it's pretty ambiguous as to what happens, what went wrong to a very data product-centered view where I get an alert that something related to my org dashboards has gone wrong, and we pull in all of the context as possible to help tell you exactly why things failed. In this case, it was something upstream, which again can be very ambiguous. And so this is the product that we now have in private preview. We have been using it with a couple of design partners to date, um, and the feedback has been super great so far. Um, you know, starting from the top here, we have a public FinServe company that's tried this out, and they moved from using Google Sheets to track cross-DAG dependencies, which is a lot more common than you would think, um, to this product, and have said it's an order of magnitude better than anything else that they've used. We have a customer support CRM company that got on board, and they were struggling with the transition from you know, internal analytics and dashboards to the same operational rigor necessary to treat a data engineering team like a software engineering team, and this is exactly what they were looking for. And last but certainly not least is, you know, we've been working with a public ad company who it used to take them three weeks when something went wrong to figure out you know, where upstream it broke, and root cause analysis sets, now they can do that in the, the matter of hours. And so this is, this is open for private preview. This is a, a link to a form that you can fill out if you're interested in, in trying it out. We'd love to give you more of a one-on-one -on -one demo and, and talk about how it relates to some of your data products and pipelines. But we've also got a very long roadmap 
ahead of us. There are a couple of things that we want to layer in here. The first is cost management. So with an observability platform like this, and with a data product center view, you can start to pull in cost information, not only on what you spend on Airflow, but also what compute you drive in underlying systems like Snowflake and Databricks, giving you that global picture of you know, how much it spend, uh, how much it costs for you to deliver each of these data products is, is something that we definitely want to move towards. And we're also building out a full like recommendations and insights engine. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, we at Astronomer are, are very, very familiar with Airflow, and we've seen all different ways of running it, both good and bad. And we're building out this recommendations platform so that you know, instead of having to talk to us to understand how you can go use Airflow better, we'll actually make proactive recommendations. And then last but you know, certainly not least is thinking about opening this up to lineage and observability outside of Airflow. Oftentimes, Airflow gives you a very good picture, but maybe not 100% complete. This is all built on a tool called Open Lineage that we've been investing in over the last couple years. It also has great support for extracting lineage and, and observability data from things like DBT and Spark and Flink and Kafka. So that's definitely something that, that we're also thinking about. But with that, yeah, thanks for the attention today.